Hey, everyone. Welcome to a special Locker Room Talk edition of the Dan and Joe Sports Show. As always, I'm Dan. And I'm Joe. All right, Joe. Uh, the epic game that we had in Jordan-Hare Stadium, and when I say epic, I don't mean like epically well played, uh, just in terms of the luckiness that Auburn had to win it and the crazy things that had to happen for the Auburn Tigers to go down with this victory and for the Missouri Tigers to go home in utter disbelief considering the future of – Eli Drinkwitz, uh, of where their program is heading and just trying to fathom how it was even humanly possible that they lost that football game. Just made me think about, you know, all the magic that's in Jordan Hare Stadium. Depending on what you are, if you're an Auburn fan, you consider it just that, you know, Auburn Jesus is on your side. If you're a Bama or a Georgia fan, you might consider it voodoo or witchcraft that happens when you're in Jordan Hare Stadium. But there is no doubt that uh, when games are close in Jordan-Hare Stadium, especially ones that matter, crazy things tend to happen and uh, that gets Auburn victories. And, I mean, I've seen it in person myself. I've seen it on TV so many times. And, you know, to be honest, it's one of my favorite things about being an Auburn fan. It's stressful, Joe. I probably have heart conditions because, because of it, as most Auburn fans do probably prematurely go a little gray, but it's never boring at Jordan Hare Stadium. That's one thing I can say. And this last game where Missouri had four opportunities when the expanse of 10 plays to end that game and win and probably end the career of Brian Harson as Auburn's head coach just exemplified this. And what's crazy, Joe, is it might go down right now as the most epic of the witchcraft of Jordan Hare Stadium. But what I'm going to do through more of the locker room talk is the other games that I think could maybe be put in the same vein. Our locker room talk is, of course, always brought to you by our fine sponsor, Hunter and Ginger Harrelson of Beach Ball Properties. Uh, the fall weather has come out. It is beautiful outside right now. If you want to go down to the beach where the water is still a little bit, you know, still warm enough for you to swim, but it's not a billion degrees outside, give Hunter and Ginger a call and have yourself – a ball at the beach in fall. Sounds good. All right, Joe. Um, one of these games that – this is not one that I attended personally, but the ending of this Missouri game reminded me of it. And this was a season that was a kind of maybe similar a little bit to this season, 2005. Auburn started off that season. They played Georgia Tech. This is talking about this. And Georgia Tech beat Auburn, Joe. I think they had five interceptions of Brandon Cox. That was the first uh, start that, that Brandon Cox had as an Auburn quarterback. Auburn had a little bit of a rough beginning to their season, but they turned it around and they played Georgia in a game that I think was between top 15 teams. And Mark Ripped was at Georgia. And uh, DJ Shockley was Georgia's quarterback. Uh, they I think they actually Georgia ended up playing in the SEC championship that year. And Auburn was facing a fourth down. It was a long fourth down. They were down by two points. Uh, Brandon Cox uh, hits a wide open Devin Aroma should do for what looks to be a touchdown. He's streaking down the field. A Georgia DB comes out of nowhere, knocks the ball out, and it's about to go through the end zone. But an Auburn wide receiver just kind of, you know, just magically appears, recovers it in the back of the end zone. And I remember this is before instant replay was a thing, and the officials had to think about what was going to happen. I felt like they met for like five minutes, and they ultimately decided that you can't advance a fumble to score a touchdown, but that Auburn did recover the fumble, and they gave Auburn the ball at the two-yard line, and this was the last play of the game. And Auburn had an automatic kicker named John Vaughn, and he made the field goal, and Auburn beat Georgia 31 to 30. And it was, you know, it's a little bit different than the Missouri game because obviously the Missouri player fumbled it, and Auburn recovered in the back of the end zone. But the fumble recovery in the back of the end zone to win a football game made me think of that one. And that was my first crazy Jordan Hare story. Uh, that's a crazy one. It was a crazy one. It was great because, of course, this was in the Deep South's oldest rivalry. Uh, whenever Auburn beats Georgia, it makes me particularly happy. And that was maybe – it's one of my all-time favorite uh, Auburn games I've ever seen. I can see that. All right, Joe, the next one, sticking with Georgia, is, of course, the prayer in Jordan-Hare. And we're sticking with this fourth down motif right here. 
It's fourth and 18. This is uh, Auburn. They're, they got a chance right now if they win this game to have a winner-takes-all matchup against Alabama in the Iron Bowl to go to the SEC Championship. But they have to play a pesky Georgia team. And this is a Georgia team who has a lot of talent like they always did, but they kind of underperformed that year. Aaron Murray was a senior. A lot of people had very high expectations for Georgia. They had played in the SEC Championship the year before, gone toe-to-toe with Alabama and lost the Classic. This Georgia team had dropped a lot of games, and Auburn got out to a huge lead against them, but Aaron Murray, as he always did, played excellent in the Deep South. Sold his rivalry, brought Georgia back into the game, and had scored a touchdown on a play like on fourth and goal, which to this day I don't think he scored a touchdown, but that's neither here nor there. Uh, Auburn got the ball back deep in the red zone, and Georgia's defense came and stopped them, and Nick Marshall has a fourth and 18 and he just throws, you know, basically just throws it up for grabs. And Trey Matthews is one of the Georgia players. They're double covering Ricardo Lewis. And Trey Matthews is all over the ball, but instead of knocking it down, he knocks it up, and the ball just magically appears in Ricardo Lewis's hands. He's four or five yards ahead of him, and he runs it in for a touchdown, and Auburn ends up beating Georgia. And they call it the prayer of Jordan Hare. Yeah, I remember that one very well from 2013. From 2013. And, Joe, this leads into our next one, which happened a mere two weeks later, and that's the pick six, the kick six game. And, of course, uh, you know, everybody knows that one. This was uh, – Alabama was number one. They were – they had been one back-to-back national championships with A.J. McCarron. They were going for number three, and Auburn at that point was number four in the country, and whoever won would go to the SEC championship – Ironically, to play Missouri, kind of funny now that you think about that. Uh, and Alabama was uh, was tied at this game. And unlike the Missouri game we mentioned earlier, this may have been one of the most well-played football games I've ever seen. I mean, there were so many epic moments in that game from both sides that made it as tight as it was. From an amazing fourth down stop, uh, I can't think of his name right now, but he play, uh, plays in the NFL. Really great defensive lineman, defensive end for Auburn. I think he plays for the Jets. Uh, and then, of course, you had um, Amari Cooper have like two 99-yard touchdowns, like nuts. But then uh, we're, we're tied, 57-yard field goal. Uh, I think Amari Cooper catches the ball and goes out of bounds. And, of course, they look at it for, like, forever to decide whether or not they should add a second on the clock and give Alabama this play. Ultimately, and it was the right call, there was a second left. If you watch it, there was a legit second when he stepped out of bounds. The kicker gets up, kicks the field goal. I think it was uh, Bullivis. And, of course, uh, Chris Davis is back there just on the off chance that it's short. Turns out to be short, and the rest is history, which, of course, is Chris Davis returning it for the touchdown, and the late, great Rod Bramlett had, in my opinion, the greatest call of a play in the history of college football. Yeah, I was glad we got to talk to Rod Bramlett about, about that the next year. One of my favorite interviews. That was great that we got to talk to him about it and talk about his, his great calls that he had. It's it's a sad thing that he's no longer with us, truly. Mm-hmm. Right. And, Joe, the last one, which you know is very fitting right now and is going to lead me into where we're going next, is the 2016 Auburn LSU game. And on the surface, this game didn't have the same kind of meaning as these other ones. It wasn't uh, It wasn't one of Auburn's two biggest rivals, although Auburn LSU is a very intense rivalry, a lot of hatred in that one. Um, you know, and I've actually noticed from being at Auburn that I think that Auburn fans in general are some of the classiest fans. I think we treat opposing fan bases very well. Uh, I can't say that's true about LSU, though. Auburn fans are mean to LSU fans. It's a very mean-hearted rivalry. And this game in 2016 really exemplified this. Uh, my brother is a, went to LSU, a big LSU fan, and he's had a lot of negative experiences in Auburn. I've seen it firsthand. And this game was a negative experience for the LSU program. Uh, 2016, both Auburn and LSU had gotten off to pretty rough starts. And it was basically all but said everywhere in the media and the coaches knew it that whoever lost this game between Gus Malzahn and Les Miles was going to get the pink slip. They were going to get fired. And, you know, not a lot, uh, kind of an ugly game throughout most of it. Defensive battle, LSU's driving at the very end. They pick up a first down. 
but the guy didn't get out of bounds. And they kind of, I feel like they had about seven seconds with which to work and able to get the snap off. And, you know, at first at glimpse, it looks like maybe he got the snap off and they throw a touchdown pass. It's like a 20 yard touchdown pass to win the game, Danny Etling. But then you look at the replay and I remember I was watching this game in New Orleans at uh, Pat O'Brien's, which is a cool place to watch a, watch a game, not just, uh, you know, have one of their classic drinks, which of course is the hurricane, the signature one, but the actual, like, you know, the inside bar they have on the right is a really cool place to watch a football game. Of course I'm in new Orleans. I'm like probably the only person cheering for Auburn. And when they show the replay, I remember I started losing my mind. I'm like, he did not get that snap off in time. They're going to, they're going to go back and look at it. He's not going to get the snap off in time. And I remember there was some LSU fan next to me. looked like he could be on Duck Dynasty. He was like, what are you talking about? He definitely got that snap off. I'm like, no, he didn't. You're about to see. And they, they review it. It turns out he didn't get the snap off in time. Auburn wins. Les Miles loses his job the next day. Gus Malzahn keeps it. And this Auburn team, which is eerily similar to this Auburn team, had, a good, had good running backs. You had on Johnson. And I cannot remember the other guy's name, but he was a big bruising running back. Um, and it was like a good one-two punch. They mm-hmm. had very poor quarterback play, but a good defense. And they went on a run after this, Joe. They had, poor, had a poor start to the season. They lost to Clemson with Kelly Bryant, not the best Clemson team. And it was coaching malpractice by Gus because I think there was that game where he had four quarterbacks on the field at the same play, kept switching them in and out. Really awful. It was a game that I took my wife to, and the defense played out of their minds, but the offense, and especially Gus Malzahn's poor play calling, cost them that game. Uh, after they won this LSU game, they went on a run, and they actually had the chance, had they beat a Georgia team who they were better than, but yet again couldn't score any points. I think Georgia had a pick six that won them that game. They actually would have played Alabama for a chance to win the SEC West. And, you know, this Auburn team was thought well enough of at the end of the year. They uh, played in the Sugar Bowl and lost to Baker Mayfield in Oklahoma. But the next season, they win the SEC West, beating Alabama and Georgia, who ultimately ended up playing for the national championship. Gus Malzahn got his huge contract extension, and he went from almost being fired the first, you know, four weeks in the season in 2016 to being a $49 million man. And now I'm suddenly thinking to myself, well, Brian Harson just escaped a game that he shouldn't have won. Now he's playing LSU at home. He's got a pretty good defense that can win games for him. He's got good running backs, but he doesn't have any quarterback play. Could it be 2016 all over again? Could Auburn fans be excited about what's to come in 2023? Remains to be seen, Joe. We'll see. We'll see. That's very, see. very intriguing. It is. You know. You can say uh, say what you want. Auburn fans, like me, we could be somewhat delusional. But you know what? You've seen it with your own eyes, just like what happened last week. There's no way that Auburn should have won that game. And I can't say never is never with my pipe dreams based on the fact that there's history to back it up, Joe. <laughs> it's fascinating to hear you talk about it. That's right. All right, man. When we come back, we're going to talk about the games that we have coming up next week, starting off with that Auburn-LSU game. Uh, you can catch all of our episodes on Spotify. You can tune into classic locker room talks like this, probably my favorite segment on uh, YouTube. And of course, you can follow us on Twitter at DJ Sports Show. And as always, I'm Dan. And I'm Joe.